Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. One of my favorite client stories relates to a woman, and we're going to talk about body language today. And this example that I'm going to tell you really (laughs) was such a clear and almost dramatic example of how body language really impacts attraction and dating. So she actually flew to work with me from Canada and she was in her thirties and she had um, a background, cultural background that was you know, Indian descent. And she had grown up in a household that really cultivated more education and success. And when it came to social stuff and emotions and connecting, it just wasn't learned in her household. So not only that, she wasn't even allowed to date until she was, I'd say maybe in her early 20s, late teens. So she really was a fish out of water when she came to me. Not only did she want to kind of understand the nuances of dating in this kind of new world that she was embarking upon, but also she didn't know what she was doing wrong because the guys that she was attracting tended to be either man children or narcissists. And she didn't understand why this you know, kept happening. And she was thinking, well, are all men like that? So she came to me and we did our whole assessment and I'm understanding, you know, her journey. And as I'm looking at her, I'm realizing that her body positioning is really distant from me. She would sit kind of far from me, her eye contact, she would kind of look down when I was talking to her and I was just kind of noticing that. But what was really profound (laughs) is that we ended up going to a hotel bar and we were going to go talk to men and I was teaching her just about approach and, and all that. So we're, and I don't know if you guys can envision this, but just bear with me because I don't have a visual to, to give you guys. There was this huge lobby in the hotel and next to the huge lobby, there was this little room that was more like a boutique kind of area where it was more exclusive. Well, we were in the big part of the room. And as I was talking to her, as I would step towards her, she would take a step back. (laughs) And then I would take another step forward. She would take another step back. And after like 10 minutes, I stop her and I said, will you look where you are? And she looked up and she's like, oh my God, we were in that other boutique room. And she said, how did we get here? I said, because you keep backing up every time I talk to you and I'm trying to get closer to you. And what we realized that so much of her body language sent a message, not just to me, but I saw it clearly with men that she was scared. She was scared of being close. And a lot of it had to do with her upbringing, right? But she was scared of the unknown and worried about how she was coming across. So she looked anxious in her body language. So then we really started working on things. And by the end of the night, I'm happy to say I kind of created a monster, actually. (laughs) We went into this other area where there were a lot of men and I helped her engage and I helped her stand closer to the man and start offering more about herself and being that charismatic girl that I knew was in there somewhere. And before I knew it, she and this guy, they were on. And so much so, they connected so well. It was time for me to go. My job was done there. I left them and I got a text the next morning that they actually ended up making out that night. (laughs) So, and you know, for her, that was great because she needed more of that experience that was outside of relationships, just more about, you know, putting herself out there. And he was a great guy and, and just, it was a fun night for her. So, you know, really a lot of what I do is teaching people about their body language, the way they communicate both nonverbal and verbal. But with us today, we have a specialist in body language. So I am super excited to have her on. Not only that, she's a Midwest sister, so this is going to be a fun one. She's a body language trainer, and she holds a master's in science of management. And through communication techniques she and training, she allows clients to be perceived as they intend to be. I love that. 
and to better decode the nonverbal cues they experience. So she really teaches people reading skills, which is so crucial when it comes to dating. And she's been all over the place, ABC, CBS, NBC, you name it. Without further ado, Lisa Mitchell. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Thanks so much for having me on, Kim. Oh my God. Thanks for coming on. I, well, I was really excited to talk to you as we were chatting before. I sw- we probably should have turned on the podcast before because we were having a great conversation. No, it seems like all the really great nuggets happen before, you know, before and after the mics are turned on. So always, always. We'll, we'll catch well, everybody up though. It'll be fine. I, exactly. Well, what Lisa and I were talking about just to catch people up is that there's like this Midwest code that people have often where it's like we kind of speak the same language. And I find this to be true in different regions. But not only that, like I think even body language, because I find Midwest body language is even different than LA. I don't know if that's something that I dreamed up, but you may know about. But I really, I see a difference in the way people carry themselves. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think um, one of the one of the filters that I train to help people really feel confident in their accuracy of decoding is all around the concept of context. So what else is going on? What else environmental is helping to have you present in that way? And how much of it do you own? How much of it is circumstantial based on on location and, and who's around and what else is going on? It's It's kind of one of the really key filters to making sure that you know, you're not owning something that's not yours to own. And, and conversely, you're taking credit for what you're creating too. So it's um, just a, a good way to get a little bit more confident in your decoding skills. I love that. Well, and you know, I have some training in neurolinguistic programming and I don't NLP. know if you're familiar. I love yeah, it. NLP, baby, you know me. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, but what we learned is that you know, alignment and matching and mirroring people is such an important part of connection you know, and really kind of getting into that rapport with somebody. So to your point, it's really great knowing how to read your environment. And when it comes to attraction and love, that is crucial. Oh my gosh. There's no more, no more important landscape to try to crack the code on than that one. Yeah. Oh my God. Well, I can't wait to hear your tips, but before we go into that, I really, I'm dying to know your story. Like how did you get into this? It's, Cause it's a really specific niche. I mean, I teach some of it, but you're really teaching this full on. Yeah. Well, I, it's, it kind of became a necessary tool in, in one part of my journey. So I have a very uh, traditional background as far as, uh, I spent almost 18 years in corporate America. I I, uh, was in operations for a national media company for the bulk of that career and got, you know, got married at 22 and and did this, the suburban life and the ladder climbing and the degree getting and, and all of those things that I would thought I was supposed to do just based on my age milestones. And in Midwest age, you know, it's not even like, Chicago Midwest, where it's okay to be single at 30. It's like <laughs> right. Small town Ohio Midwest, which is like, if you aren't married by 22, what is wrong with you? Oh you know? my God. So, totally. That is how it yes, is. Yes. <laughs> yes. And, and so I was married at 22 because why not? That's, that's what we did. That's what you're supposed to do. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I did kind of the traditional path and um, I've always had kind of an entrepreneurial spirit. So through the course of having my corporate job, I also, uh, got into small business ownership. So I had a a series or a a small chain of um, kind of organic uh, small town feeling coffee shops here in in the Indianapolis area and uh, ended up with four locations all together at one point and had a one-year-old at home and a husband that was horribly neglected. So all of that kind of crashed and burned. (laughs) Um, I, I kind of just pushed the reset button on my life at the end of 2008 and, um, it, it, you know, there's opportunity costs for everything, right? So you don't just get to reset your life with businesses and husbands and all of that fun stuff without, uh, without some cost financially and emotionally. So, uh, that, that set me back a minute. I kind of took my ball and went home and stayed safe in my corporate America job and collected a paycheck for, a number of years, honestly, like mm-hmm. four or five years, I was on autopilot. I'm like, I don't want to be challenged. I'm not ever building anything. I don't want to learn anything new. Yeah. It's scary and bad and it, it doesn't end well. Um, so I had kind of a crappy attitude to be honest with you for a while um, and played it really safe. And then of course, then my convictions kicked in and it's like, no, but you're meant for more. You need to have an impact. You need to build something. And so I fired all the personal development stuff back up to re-engage my brain after about 
you know, five or six years on hiatus and, and really started figuring out what do I want to learn? What excites me? How do I think I can help people? Um, and ultimately made the decision that I, it was not going to be fulfilled in that corporate environment. Not for me, not for the position that I had found myself in. Um, mm -hmm. I was allowed to be on autopilot at that point and I'd kind of topped out. So I had an opportunity to make a graceful exit from that at the end of 2014. So I thought, let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. And I ended up running a tech startup. Oh, really? Based out of Washington, D.C. Yep. And it was a tech startup that was focused on educating and equipping entrepreneurs, which was cool, except I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about how you funded a tech company or build a team in a tech company. Um, so it, for me, it was kind of fun. It was like learning a new language because I had to learn it. It was the complete and polar opposite of how corporate America works. Mm-hmm. Or how even really small business ownership worked from a traditional brick and mortar versus, you know, a tech startup. So through that to bring me back to the body language training. Yeah. I'm like, where is this going? I can't I, even I imagine from the to God I'm getting there. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I, just, I went all the way around the house um, to get back to the front door for you. But, um, Love it. but the context of it was as educating and equipping entrepreneurs, um, I sat through a lot of business pitches. So I would go to pitch competitions and startup weekends and, and mm -hmm. was really immersed in that community and they sucked. Like, and these were people that I knew that were brilliant and had amazing technology and ideas and could change lives and save lives in some matter. And they were horrible. Like I knew what they were doing and I was still like, huh? Like, what is that? What, what's your product again? So I'm always looking for the easy hack for the, the mm -hmm. instant gratification. And for me, I'm like, okay, how can I move the needle forward for these people? And it was body language, which is like really a weird thing to figure out, but it's like, you can get almost instant results. Oh my God. It's so true. We're all born with it, right? It doesn't discriminate by the innate, you know, existence of being human. We have body language skills. We just, it's a gift, but it takes so little to really develop to a, to a point where you're effective. So yeah. for me, I dove into that. I got additional education around the science of nonverbal communication and body language. And I started using that to, to really hack, <laughs> hack the pitches, um, uh -huh. to get these people into that next, that next conversation. You know, how do you get the money? How do you get the teammates? Well, you, you create some intrigue. You show up on stage as charismatic and competent and confident, mm -hmm. all of which they were kind of failing to do before. And it really moved the needle quickly on, and open up the opportunity to read the difference really between some people packing it up and going home or getting their companies funded, you know? So that's kind of where I started with body language application was with the entrepreneurs. And now I, I really specialize in executive coaching and corporate training. I'm kind of changing the communication temperature inside of organizations for better results and really just more effective, um, more effective leadership, especially with the transition of millennials coming into the workforce. And, oh, yeah. um, you know, it's a, it's a whole new ball game now from, from all sides of the spectrum. So I'm, I'm having fun figuring out how we can, how we can move companies, um, and really people forward in a more effective way. And body language has been a great little hack. I love that whole journey that you took, Lisa, because, you know, I think we all have had such journeys in getting to where we are. And I actually wanted to ask a more personal question. I feel like I can do that with you because we're like Midwest sisters. Totally. Um, open, open back that, over here. <laughs> I know. And the fact that we had similar journeys, you know, because, okay, so full disclosure, I know for me, when I segued from being just a traditional therapist going into being a dating coach and then also dating, <laughs> you know, myself, obviously I learned a lot along the way, both with my personal and professional journey. So like, I wondered for you, I, you know, obviously your focus was more corporate, but how was it with your own body language and things that you noticed when it came to body language and dating? Yeah. Well, you know, what's really interesting is part of, part of the failure of my, my marriage and part of the failure of my business when I really kind of did the postmortem on those things was that I was not clued in at all. Mm -hmm. I was very self-focused. I wasn't aware of what other people were, were sending my way um, directly or indirectly. And it really, I mean, that came at a really high cost. So I kind of knew that I was lacking and that skill set, that like awareness <laughs> right. and decoding was not really my strength. 
Um, so that's part of, part of why I pursued the science, not only because it was practical to, to my work, but was to help me, was to give me a tool because I'm like, I don't want to make the same mistakes again. I know. So wait, I, okay, wait, hold on. So what mistakes did you make? Like, do you remember some of them? I remember, I mean, there were things I would have, um, I would have conversations towards, you know, the, the final stages of my relationship where there were things it's like, well, I've been, I've been trying to tell you this for months. I'm uh -huh. like, well, I haven't heard you say it. It's like, no, but when I stop, you know, when I'm living in the basement or when I stop connecting with you at meals or when I did this or like, it, it was like a laundry list of things that I just experienced, but didn't really decode. I didn't put meaning behind it. It was just very like procedural. Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of uh, blissfully unaware, whether that was kind of to be protective because I didn't want to see it, or I just was so exhausted from everything going on. I didn't have the energy to acknowledge it. So I just kind mm -hmm. of ignored stuff. Um, so I think part of it was willfully ignoring because I didn't want to put the energy into dealing with it. And part of it was really just, I had no idea. I just right. thought everything was cool because nobody told me otherwise. Um, right, so, right. so that's alarming. Like that's a really alarming <laughs> skill to be missing, especially when you think about, oh my God, I'm going to be starting to hang out with unknown entities again. Well, right? it's so, but look, this is all of us. And this is why I love doing what I do when I go out with people and do my wing girl sessions. I always say to people like, you can't see what you can't see, you know? I mean, it's just, right. you just can't. So I often tell like I'm, I'm somebody's mirror and saying, look, this is what I'm seeing you do. But you know, and I'm sure I, I we all do. We all have things and nuances in our body language and, and nonverbal cues that sends messages out there to the world. So I love that you just said that because I hope everybody listening, I mean, you know, it's like, we're, we're all joining in everybody because we, we've learned ourselves personally. Oh yeah. I'm, right? I'm like, heck yeah. It was like survival for me. I'm like, I've got to do this better. Like I have got to find a way to clue in. I got to know what I'm seeing when I like, not only what to look for, but then what it means. And then how do I respond? Like I need a strategy. I'm an operations person at heart. Like my brain works like a giant old school, like Vizio map with yeah. and shapes and stuff. I need a process. I need a tool. So for me, learning the science of body language and nonverbal communication gave me the confidence to feel equipped. And I think that's what so many people are missing yeah. when, when they enter the dating realm, whether it's, you know, the first time back out after a divorce or when they finally kind of turn that corner from recreational to, to meaningful. It's, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to look for. I don't understand what's going on. And by just learning a couple of key skills, you really can show up more confident. You know, you're better equipped. It's like a superhero that has like a super amazing decked out, you know, Batman's belt, like how many gadgets <laughs> exactly. on Batman's belt, right? Now right. He, only, he only maybe needs one or two, but dang man, he walks in with some swagger, right? He's got Absolutely. all the swagger in the world because he is equipped, right? Okay. So yeah, well, let's dive into it. What, what, tools did you develop over time that you could give the listeners that really helped you navigate the whole dating scene with your body language? Well, I kind of approach everything from, from two perspectives, from kind of a playbook perspective. So I, I, mm -hmm. I teach and I use things from an offense and a defense perspective. So from offense, that's all around the theory of managing yourself. So for me, when I understand how people perceive me as either open or closed, as interested or disinterested as engaged or disengaged, then I can make sure, okay, I need to make sure that I don't um, cross my arms over my torso. I need to make sure that I'm leaning in um, and, and drawing them into me if I'm really interested. I need to pay attention to where my feet are angled. Um, am I angled towards them or am I signaling them subconsciously that I want to run to the exit? You know, like, like I need to manage myself by understanding how someone else is experiencing me. Um, how do you know though? How do you know how other people are experiencing? You don't always know, but what I like to say is make it really easy for people to read you the right way. Mm. So if, if I know by maintaining, uh, you know, 60 to 70% eye contact is ideal. If, if I know that angling right. my body towards someone makes them feel like I'm, I'm engaged and giving them attention. And if I know that, that leaning in or, or exhibiting a, a preening behavior is going to kind of signal to them subconsciously that, Hey, I'm kind of feeling you, then those are all tools I can use to make it really easy for that person to, to pick up what I'm putting down. 
Awesome. Right? You want to lead that. people right where you, where you want them to land with you. Um, and the same works if you're trying to tell someone you're not interested. Right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you just do all the negative nonverbal cues and hope they have some level of self-awareness to pick up on them. Right, right. No, and that's good too when it comes to like trying to exit a conversation right. or, right, yeah, that's great. So, okay, so managing yourself is your first tip. What's the second? Right, the second one is knowing knowing what to look for on the other side of your face. So how, and this is, goes back to your question about how do you know how you're landing with someone? It's kind of cause and effect. So when you lean in, most people's natural inclination is to mirror a little bit. So do they lean in and meet you or do they lean back? Is there a sign of discomfort? You know, mm -hmm. you can kind of gauge, you can kind of gauge where you're at with them. My, one of the favorite things I love to do is, is ask a, a fairly pointed question, maybe about a, if, if they're divorced, maybe about the dynamic with their ex, or I'm not afraid to go there. I, I think disclosure is always better than guessing. Yeah. Um, so I'll ask a question and then watch to see um, what are their feet do? Because mm -hmm. our feet and legs are the most honest part of our body historically. They're the ones we consciously manage the least. So it's where oh, it's, where it's so that, fascinating. Yeah, it, they really are truth tellers. They tell you where people want to be, who holds the power in a group. They tell you all sorts of stuff. But in the context of dating, from a decoding or defense standpoint, if you ask a, a question and you see, you know, maybe they're they're open or or uh, you know, kind of sprawled out, comfortable, and then you ask a question and all of a sudden the feet tuck up under the chair. Right. That what does varies. that mean? it means that they're, they're not comfortable. They're either withholding information or they're, they're not wanting to engage in that particular topic. So, uh -huh. so especially, it, and the key to, to a lot of decoding is looking for variants. So what's normal for that person, kind of like the concept of a baseline. Are they normally very open and animated? Um, and if so, when do they stop doing that? When do they vary from their normal behavior? Because that's where you as, as a decoding person can say, mm -hmm. okay, this is where I'm seeing a change from their normal. This is probably a sensitive topic, or I may want to dig deeper here when I've earned the right to, to go further in this conversation. Um, so it can, it can kind of help you gauge maybe where some sensitivities or maybe some non-disclosures are happening and, and just help you make better, more informed decisions about who you're spending your time with. And I want to piggyback off of that because what's really interesting about decoding and what you're saying, there's so many little nuances that go into body language and, and understanding how to read people so that you know how to progress with them, basically is what you're saying. Yes. And, and when it comes to flirting, and this is the stuff I teach, body language is huge and knowing yes. if somebody's attracted to you. So, you know, for, for women, um, you know, if a guy is standing with his legs apart or he's sitting a little bit open and he's showing his stuff, right. <laughs> that means he's attracted to you, right? Yes, a little, a little prominent display of, 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 of his good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Without going into it too much. Um, so that is like one thing. And then, uh, men, if you see a lady twirling her hair and playing with her hair, and actually both men and women will play with their hair when they're attracted to one another. So um, again, you do, it's not like you have to do this over the top because then the question I got and, and get, and I don't know if you get this too, is like, well, do then I purposely, when I'm talking to a guy, twirl my hair forever? It's like, well, no, you don't have to like, be, <laughs> you know, obvious about it and weird. And you're going to be doing these things that aren't you and pretend like you're Meryl Monroe and do all these weird things. But, but you may want to be mindful of the things that you do do, and you may want to amplify that a little so that exactly yes. they pick like, it up, right? You have to, the, the thing that, that I love about, you know, this particular realm is that there's so much science behind it. And so studies show for women, basically, we have to be way more obvious than we're normally comfortable being not playing a role or a character, but science just shows that it takes like 12 or 13 more introductions for a man to pick up on something. Oh my God. I love that you just said that. I can't believe, I can't believe we've never talked before. It's just so <laughs> weird. 
<laughs> it's like it's, the synergy is crazy because I what I tell people all the time. I said, "What you think is over the top is normal to me." You're gonna feel like super Captain Obvious, like blinking pink light above your head. But but right. But you have to think right. This is where we have to quit being so damn selfish when we date. It's like you have to think about how is the other person receiving me? How do they learn? What do they notice? And well, how and I can think, I have a little, a little more confidence in how that I'm getting them what they need to pick up what I'm trying to communicate to them? Well, that's the key word is confidence. And I think a lot of times when women don't give signals like that, there is this kind of perception or association with some of these signals that they're going to give the man the wrong signal, or they don't want to be um, looked at as too sexual or, you know, I, I hear, I've heard every excuse under the sun and I've done a whole podcast on this, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. And I think right. it's like what you, what you said, it's, it's, if you learn and you think about this stuff, ladies, as a science and that this is actually proven, this isn't just us being kind of like giddy little girls. It's, I mean, look, we see this in the animal kingdom, right? We, we see pruning and, and all of that stuff happening. There's signals that just is so primal to us that, but men men in particular really need, it's almost like sending smoke signals or hitting them over the head with a bat. Cause we feel like that's what we're doing, but it really, that is what's normal. That's right. And I, and I think a lot of women get like, they, they think they're signaling in the proper amount or in the right ways. And then they get frustrated or they lose confidence when they don't immediately get that acknowledgement. Or yes. they don't get the response. And it, it, it's just a simple, it, it's just the understanding of how really ultimately how our brains process information differently and what catches our attention. So it's, it's for me, it's like, no ladies, you got to play the long game. Like, That's awesome. And, and repetition. Yeah. And, and you really need to, you know, you're going to have to do some work right? You're, it's not instant gratification, which is hard for a girl like me. Cause that's what I want. I want to mm. like bat my eyes and get the dude. And that's all the effort I want to put into it. <laughs> science, right. science tells me I'm not going to get the result I'm looking for with that kind of, you know, half-ass strategy. So it, it's one of those things where I just encourage people to play the long game, know, know what clues or what cues you need to be using. And then also then be a little patient. And, and double up, mm. like cluster is another big, another big technique, right? So do the eye contact, do the body positioning, do the hair twirl, you know, send mm -hmm. multiple signals. So if they miss one, if one flies over their head, then maybe they'll pick up on the reassurance of the other. And, and think, remember, there's, a, there's another fragile, vulnerable human being on the other side of this interaction, and they don't want to be wrong. So they're looking yeah. for additional evidence. They're collecting evidence based on your multiple behaviors that, okay, I think she likes me. Okay. I saw that. Yeah. She likes me. Okay. Now I'm a little more confident that she probably likes me. So we're already four or five cues down the road before they even feel like maybe, maybe you like them. So <laughs> repetition is key, baby. Exactly. It's, so it's positive true. reinforcement, positive reinforcement. Yes. I like you. Yes. I like you. Yes. I still, like you. <laughs> right. Just, and you got to kind of, you almost have to be the cheerleader role and, and yeah. just really be like, I encourage you to feel confident approaching me or, or leading this conversation now. Well, and I want to highlight something you said that's so common that I hear a lot of my clients say is that, you know, it just feels like so much work. I mean, look, there's not too many things in life that you don't have to work at if you're going to really be successful in something. But the cool thing about this is it truly is something that will become you naturally if you do it over time and you get the results, like exactly. you said, positive reinforcement. And when you do that and you get the results, it's going to become your own language. I, I tell people all the time, learning this stuff is like learning Spanish or German or, you know, for a for, it's a foreign language. And if right. you aren't used to it, what do you have to do? You have to practice it. Right. Because anytime you learn something new, right, there's discomfort before there's adaption. Yes. And so you have to like, and it's so weird, like even doing like the retraining myself from a basic body language perspective, even how I stand and default, like I was very much an arms crossed 
um, as a uh, default. Like when I'm having meeting people or networking, my I'm just comfortable with with my arms crossed. But once I understood how people were perceiving me as maybe protective or insecure or or blocking them, and it was having the opposite outcome, I now have to really be mindful about standing in an open posture with my arms loose by my side. And sometimes I use a prop like a drink or, you know, I, I'm, nice. I'm, I'm playing with it until it becomes my, my go-to, my default. Um, I so there's, that, there's that weirdo, like there's still a lot of things I'm, I'm training myself to, to get into that automatic phase that I, honestly are not there yet for me. But, um, but the biggest question is, do you have the resting bitch face? <laughs> not anymore because now Woo! I understand that there is no such thing uh -huh. as not being on, especially when there's recorded devices. But I will tell you when my daughter has my phone and takes pictures of me when I'm not expecting it, guess what I see? The resting bitch face. Right? So yeah. I have to be super vigilant about keeping my my cheek muscles engaged. We'll, we'll say it that way. It's so important, ladies. If there's one <laughs> takeaway that you could get from today, please smile. I mean, this is just something that I see over and over. It's almost an epidemic, to be honest. Oh my and, gosh, honestly. And I, my theory... I, my theory is that it's become more rampant these days because we are all so much multitasking and never before, especially women, have we been doing so many things in any other generation. I mean, now we work and we're moms and we're this and we're that, and we have our head filled with stuff. So the resting bitch face is often us just thinking of everything that we have to do, but then it, it comes across as bitchy, unapproachable, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a great thing. Well, I uh, I seriously could go on and on with you, but <laughs> we I will definitely have you on again. Um, yes, part two, part two, yeah, coming through. part two. Duh. Um, we're gonna. I just want to recap what you said because you gave some really good tips. I mean, the first one being is is really pulling in and looking at yourself by managing yourself. How do other people perceive you? Look at how you hold your arms, your feet, the eye contact, the resting bitch face, all of that stuff. Once you have that awareness, I always say that awareness is the first step to change. You yes. have to be aware of that. And then the second thing you said is, is part of the decoding and that is managing others. How, you know, knowing what to look for with others and mirroring people and asking questions and looking at their feet. And this is part of tapping into your environment and who's in front of you. And guess what? When you do that, when you start looking at other people and decoding this, it helps you get out of your head of your own stuff. Exactly. Because so much of us <laughs> are in our heads, right? And that's what prevents us from opportunity because we're worried about our hair and how we're coming across. And oh my God, does he like me? And look at that girl, she's prettier. Blah, blah, blah. Turn that off and be present and look at the person ahead of you. And what Lisa is saying will give you almost a tool so that you can do that. And then the third, I love this, is clustering, sending multiple signals over and over and over again until he or she gets it. And usually if you do that by the end of the, the date or the social interaction, you will get asked out because they will get the signal and they will feel some sort of chemistry that gets created. Well, Lisa, it was awesome having you. Thank you so much for having on. Do you have any last tips and definitely let us know how we can find you? Yeah. Well, the last tip is really just show up as your most confident clued in self in any situation because you never really know where an opportunity or a connection can be made. So be on before you're technically on because you would hate to hate to miss an opportunity. Things, the best things often come when we least expect it. So just yeah. making confident entry, your, your default is always a great strategy and that's business or romance. Um, you can't ever not benefit from showing up as your most confident self. So that would be kind of my one takeaway focus. Um, and then if people want to connect with me, I, I, I love to interact and answer questions. Uh, they can find me at powerbodylanguage.com. Um, I do some fun stuff on Instagram, on my Instagram stories, and that's at Lisa Mitchell Indy. Um, so I, I would love to connect further with your, with your listeners. 
Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, thanks for joining me today. This has been the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And if you want to know what archetype you are, and by the way, in this quiz, if you go to my site, seltzerstyle.com, you can even try to have that self-management and awareness of your own body language to determine what archetype you are. So make sure you hop on that. Stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day. And for those of you who really want to put this stuff into practice, you got to check out my new retreat program. Ooh, I'm so excited about it. It's called the Dating Makeover Bootcamp. It's coming up and it combines a group coaching program and it culminates into a beautiful retreat in a luxe resort here in Southern California. Click the link to find out more, sign up to talk with me about it. Spaces are limited. I'm only taking a small amount of women and it starts January 8th. Thank you.